It's time to close the book on infectious diseases and declare the war against pestilence over. That's a quote that was attributed to William Stewart. He was the Surgeon General in the United States in the late 1960s. Uh, and it's one of the most widely used quotes in the field of infectious disease. And yet, it's almost certain that he never said it. It was at the time when really strong views uh, were prevalent that uh, the problems of infectious disease that had killed so many in the 19th century and up to the early 20th century were a thing of the past, that our understanding of the microorganisms, uh, of vaccines, uh, and our new technologies had won the battle. And in that context, what Dr. Stewart actually said, which was, we still have red flags in the field of communicable disease, uh, and we must not forget our traditional responsibilities, was forgotten. Um, and instead, a quote that's almost certainly not uh, correct uh, was attributed to him. Now, why am I telling you this 50 years later when I'm talking about the future of infectious diseases? And the reason is because it seems to me that uh, unless we learn lessons from the past, history tends to repeat itself. And we'll see new technologies uh, and the shiny things that we've got developing, uh, and we'll think that the job is done, the battle is over. Now, don't get me wrong, new technologies are incredibly important. At the time that Dr. Stewart was Surgeon General, we were on the verge of global eradication of smallpox as a result of vaccination. It's one of the safest and most effective uh, things that we have uh, in the field of infectious disease. Typhoid, which had killed more British troops in the Boer War than the fighting itself, was also largely a thing of the past. And of course, antibiotics had been developed and they had a great impact and enable us still to do things like caesarean sections, hip replacements, much cancer treatment safely uh, because of them. And new technologies now are incredibly exciting. We're able over the last decade to sequence the genes of many organisms, many bacteria and viruses. In the case of TB, that allows us to make a diagnosis quickly, get people on the right treatment, and understand connections between cases that we hadn't previously understood. Uh, there will, before long, be rapid gene tests in every hospital and every GP surgery uh, where people with infection can be identified quickly, treatment started, and they can be separated from other people so as not to spread infection. Uh, at the moment, we've had to wait uh, 48 hours or more uh, before we're able to do that. And of course, there's new Ebola vaccine, which will help to prevent the massive outbreak such as we saw in West Africa in 2014-15, which infected uh, almost 30,000 people and killed over 11,000, uh, many of them children and healthcare workers who uh, were the few uh, that understood how to deal with those diseases in those countries. So um, how, um, what is it that we uh, therefore need to learn? it does seem to me that history is littered uh, with examples uh, where understanding the uh, causes of what drives infection is at least as important as understanding the biological basis. The most cited example is an old one. It's from John Snow in 1854. He was the doctor who controlled an outbreak of cholera in Soho in London. It killed over 600 people. Uh, and at the time, cholera was thought of as being due to miasma. It was the idea that filthy living conditions led to a noxious form of bad air, uh, which was generated by rotting organic materials, and epidemics uh, would uh, be rife in those circumstances. Now, John Snow had a different view. He already suspected that cholera was uh, spread in the water, and he did a very brief study. It only took a few days. And he identified that those people who were ill and dying were drawing their water from a single source, a pump in Broad Street. And the people who weren't becoming ill were drawing their water from somewhere else. As a result, his single action, which was to persuade councillors to take the handle off the pump, solved the outbreak. And he is known as the father of modern epidemiology, uh, the science of uh, understanding the spread of disease uh, uh, to understand the cause and how you prevent it as a result. He was, of course, ridiculed a little in the medical literature because he rejected the miasma theory. And in fact, it wasn't until 2013 that The Lancet uh, 
uh, published a correction of their uh, brief but inaccurate obituary of him from 1858. And all of that was at the time when the Vibrio cholera organism that causes cholera was not understood. Uh, that was not discovered until 20 years later by Robert Cox, so his action was in the absence of that knowledge. Now, there's another example I want to share with you, which was the treatment of TB in late 19th century Paris, where the story is a little different, but it illustrates a similar issue. There was an epidemiologist called Thomas Pidou, sorry, Herman Pidou, uh, and Pidou uh, identified correctly that TB was rife in places with very poor social housing and poor working conditions. He wrongly attributed it to miasma, but what he rightly did was to work with the powers that be to uh, aim to legislate uh, to improve social housing and working conditions. Now, just at the time that he was doing that work, a very important technological discovery was made. Robert Koch, again, described the biological basis of TB, the tubercle bacillus, a really important discovery that enabled people to be accurately diagnosed and some 50 years later when antibiotics were introduced enabled people to be treated effectively. But in the context of late 19th century Paris, uh, the impact was different. Pidou, who had rejected any theories other than miasma, had created this scenario where it was either miasma, which was really a reflection of poor social and working conditions, or it was a biological organism. And when he was proved wrong, he was ridiculed. And of course, all his efforts to change social conditions, which would have had such a major impact on TB in Paris at the time, failed. Now, you might say these are examples from the past. Uh, they can't possibly be of relevance today. But I'm afraid you'd be wrong. Uh, if I just stick with the example of TB, five or six years ago, we enhanced our TB control strategy in England. We enhanced it because we were seeing new cases of TB rising year on year since the low point in the 1980s. In fact, we were about, in about six or seven years ago, we were about to see more cases of TB developing in England every year than in the whole of the United States, despite its population being five times the size of ours. So we enhanced the strategy. We took a, a, a relatively simple approach. Uh, we worked with the NHS and with local government and with others to say, let's understand what the evidence says about who is at risk, what you need to do to detect, treat, uh, and uh, uh, deal with people with TB in their contacts for everybody, everywhere, all of the time. And we implemented a whole range of things that have worked. We've actually seen between a 40 and 50% reduction in the cases of new TB in the last six years as a result. Quite an astounding achievement for all of our services. And yet, at the same time, that was done without the introduction of new technologies. And we now have a brilliant new technology, the gene testing for TB. It helps us to identify cases quickly and, as I said, to control, understand the connections between people. And it is such a risk, and it's so tempting because I've heard it argued, that now we have this new technology, we don't need to worry about all the other things that we've had to do in relation to TB. Uh, so uh, in a fragile environment, economic environment, the argument is this is the investment we need to make and we can stop doing other things. Now, just as an example, one of the groups with the highest rates of TB in our societies are street homeless people in our cities. We have a specialist service for them because traditional NHS care, writing the clinic letter to somebody who's sleeping on a park bench, doesn't work. And so we have a van with an x-ray machine staffed by former homeless people who find people with TB, get them in some sort of housing, and support them through treatment. And they actually get the same treatment success for street homeless people as the NHS does for the settled housed population. And yet in this fragile economic environment for the NHS, how tempting it would be to think that the new technology is the answer to all our problems. It would be a false step. I learned something similar when dealing with Ebola outbreaks in West Africa in 2014. I had a very UK-centred approach to outbreak control in which I always ask myself three questions when I'm dealing with any infectious disease outbreak. Do we know the source? Is the source under control? And have we identified and done the right thing for every person who's been affected? 
If I can answer those three questions, then the outbreak comes under control. But what I learned in dealing with the Ebola outbreaks in West Africa from people who are used to dealing with things in lower middle income countries was actually that social science and anthropology was equally as important as understanding the biology of the disease. So people in West Africa needed to have sufficient trust in the service to come forward when they were ill. Otherwise, they died and they spent time spreading infections throughout their communities before they died without ever being identified. That was challenging enough, but equally challenging was the need to deal with some deep-seated cultural patterns of behaviour. When somebody dies from Ebola, their body is covered in Ebola virus. If your usual burial practice is to wash the body and then take the water that you've used to wash the body and sprinkle it over the nearest relatives, particularly children, in order to ward off the spiritual cause of the disease, then you have a problem. And especially so uh, if you know that your relative will not reach the afterlife unless you carry out that practice. Understanding how to change views about those uh, practices and that women in villages were actually the most influential people uh, whatever it might look like the power of the male political and community leaders was, was absolutely essential in dealing with the outbreaks and bringing them under control. And now uh, we have a new vaccine for Ebola. It's being tested at the moment in outbreaks in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and it's showing great promise. And yet there are now more than 900 cases of Ebola that have been identified in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and the majority of them are not on anybody's contact list, and so they haven't received the vaccine. Uh, and added to which, several of the Ebola treatment centres that are there have been attacked and burned over the last few weeks because of civil unrest. Once again, it's an example where civil unrest and trust in services trump the new technologies. So what does all this mean for the future of infectious disease in our society? We see with monotonous regularity new infections developing, whether it's Ebola, whether it's uh, HIV, whether it's SARS or MERS coronavirus, pandemic flu. They are all examples. And I'm utterly clear that we have to be on top of all the new technologies, the gene sequencing, new treatments, especially uh, in an era of antimicrobial resistance when the antibiotics stop working. We have to be on top of the technologies. But if we think that the technologies replace the traditional approach that we need to take to prevention and to treatment, making sure that everybody gets the right care all of the time, and understanding the impact of social behaviours and the way people behave, we will miss the point and we will have a worse problem in the future. The answer to the future of infectious disease control lies, as in so many aspects of things that I'm sure we'll discuss today, in combining excellent new technologies with a basic understanding of our humanity and social drivers of disease. Thank you.